Hello everyone, welcome to Mind Pump. In this episode, we talk about the best post-workout recovery meals, weight training for kids, and more. In the second half of the episode, the guys coach three live callers on questions such as, how can I learn to train like an old-time strongman? What are the best testosterone-boosting supplements? What is the best way to recover after an extreme deficit after a bodybuilding show? And no, it's not Pop-Tarts and Donuts. Finally, if time is limited for you and you can't always watch our full episodes, go to our other channel, Mind Pump Clips, here on YouTube and subscribe. All right, enjoy the show. The best post-workout meals for recovery tend to c contain a good combination of carbohydrates and proteins, not just protein. Carbohydrates do play a role in post-workout recovery. Now, I want to define what I mean by post-workout recovery because there's some confusion around this. Mm. Like, uh, I used to think that it meant just general recovery. Like if I don't eat this, you know, proteins and carbohydrates post-workout, I'm just not going to recover. No, no, no. You'll still recover. It's just, you're not going to recover as quickly. Meaning if you want to do another workout later, or you want to do like you divide your workouts or you have something physical later to do, or you want the, you, you basically just want to recover a little faster then your post-workout nutrition can make a difference. And the studies do show that having some carbohydrate with your, with your protein it does it better than just having protein by itself. No, okay. I, I remember I remember reading two to one, four to one. Oh yeah. That um, ratio. Where where are we at with the science on the ratio of carbohydrates to protein uh, that is the most beneficial? It's all over the place. So yeah. if it depends on the type of like what what athletic endeavor you did or workout you did before. And if it was like super endurance focused where you burn tons of glycogen, then you're going to want a higher carbohydrate to protein ratio. Like a four to one ratio. Like three to one or, you know, two to one, three to one, four depleted. to one. Yeah. If you're like lifting weights, even a one to one is perfectly fine. You just want some carbohydrates in there to sh help shuttle in the amino acids, replenish some of the glycogen. But here's the things that people really need to consider with their post-workout nutrition. Besides protein carbohydrates, it's inflammation and digestibility. Right. Because after your workout, you have this general just kind of systemic inflammation is a little higher. Like if, if you, someone tested your blood post-workout, they would notice inflammatory markers would be a little higher. This is normal. You just did a workout. It's supposed to happen. But part of that is your gut. Your gut is also slightly inflamed. And what you don't want to do is throw foods on top of that situation that are already hard to digest. So you want to pick foods that are easy to digest, that you can consume, that it feel good, not too heavy. What would be a good example of, of that? Well, so um, white rice, uh, chicken is pr typically pretty good. The company we work with now, Creatures of Habit, their their oatmeal with the plant protein. Oh, there you it's go. one of the best. Like it's super easy for me. I have uh, you know a sensitive gut. It's one of the easiest things I've ever eaten to digest. I eat it and I feel like it's like I eat nothing, and it's also super convenient. So, and that typically is for most people, right? Oatmeal plus some protein plus it's got the digestive enzymes already in there. But I think the key is. What you have post-workout, you want to have both carbohydrates and proteins, but you want to make sure it's very easily digestible. It's super important. You eat like as high calorie bloating, inflammatory producing meal, mm -hmm. you can cause yourself problems, especially in an inflammatory Which isn't state. even really a consideration that's being promoted at all, which that's is right. probably the highest one to consider because like uh, before that, it's the hysteria of I'm going to lose that muscle right. uh, building window with that, that anabolic sort of window where I can shuttle in this amount of protein and get the building blocks to kind of promote this. But, you know, to to that point, I just think that this really need to consider you may be doing yourself more harm if, if it's not something that you're digesting properly. Properly. You know, speaking of that creature's habit, the, the uh, there's a little bit of, I don't know, I'd say half and half the people, which I did not see this coming, um, that like or don't like this part about it. And because it's my favorite part is the seeds. I love the seeds. Oh, yeah. That's my favorite part of it. And actually, after we... It's no, a nice mouthfeel yeah. in the crunch. Right? It makes me it makes it feel fuller. It's a different texture. So I like it. But I think so, like, if you really like your your oatmeal, like, super, like, like runny, oatmeal runny, or really, like, almost like cream of wheat-like, then maybe that texture like throws you off. But I just didn't yeah. see that coming. Like, I thought, you know, I was wanting everyone to report back on... And I got... I've, over the last month and a half, we got all these people, uh, you know... So it was like a split of people that were like going that, for that it loved more. it or don't. Yeah. That so that everybody like the macros, of course, are amazing. The fact that it has plant protein, it the fact that it has great. the vitamin D, everyone yeah. ran, that's that's all amazing, right? 
But the one thing that I got back that was negative feedback is if someone didn't like the seeds or whatever like that in there, they were like, oh, it's just a different I used texture. to add seeds to my- I, I love, I like that. I used so. to add pumpkin seeds uh, and I would add uh, sesame mm, seeds sometimes. Flax seeds. Flax seeds, mm -hmm. yeah. No, it's, you know, this, this point really can't be overstated because they, okay, so when they look at people with gut issues, one of the causes of gut issues or one of the, one of the I guess, root issues is something known as uh, intestinal- wall hyperpermeability. We used to call this leaky gut syndrome. So this is where, you know, your gut, it's basically a barrier between you and your food. And it only is supposed to allow certain things in and not other things in at the right moment. And what happens when the gut is inflamed, that wall uh, beca it, well, it becomes leaky in essence. And it allows proteins and compounds to travel through into the bloodstream when they're not supposed to. And then what happens, your body mounts an immune response. So it identifies these, these proteins when they're not supposed to be there. You're, you build up an immune response and all of a sudden this food that you ate all the time, now all of a sudden you can't digest anymore or causes problems. Um, and so now, by the way, Western medicine now identifies this or acknowledges this in the past. If you said leaky gut syndrome, I remember saying leaky gut syndrome to doctors and they laughed me out of the room. Um, but now it's something that we know that can happen. Well, you have, generally speaking, you have more inflammation in your body right after you work out. Mm -hmm. So what was happening was that these athletes would do these crazy hard workouts and then they pound a bunch of food trying to recover and they were developing gut issues. Right. So that's why it's so important. Like right after your workout, one of the most important considerations aside from, you know, proteins and carbohydrates is does this digest well? Like, so like the protein powders that give people gas and bloat and they're having it right after the workout. <laughs> like, oh my God, you turn yourself into a ticking time bomb. Right. Or, you know, people will go eat like a, like a huge meal. People, especially on a bulk, like, Oh, we just finished our workout. Let's get a bunch of fast food. Yeah. Like you, you, you're potentially setting yourself up for some, some bad problems. So, Pick something really easily digestible right after you work out, and it'll it'll help the recovery process and not produce problems down the road. And so, and the reason why I brought up creatures of habit is because it's like very few processed meals that I can find with good macros that are things that I can eat on a regular basis because I'm so sensitive that I could do things here and there. But I have that every day. Doesn't do you have a gut. favorite flavor yet? Uh, I like the maple. Yeah. That one's the best. Spawn. What about you, Joe? You're probably, are you peanut butter? Peanut you, butter is usually the one I go with. Doug? Yeah, maple. Like maple. Maple for me. Yeah, maple and then the blueberry one. I, those two are, the, my, are my favorites for sure. Yeah. All of them taste good, though. The, the yeah, they're all my favorites. All right, today's contest, you can win free access to MAPS Aesthetic. Here's how you enter. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. Do all those things. If we pick you as the winner, we'll notify you in the comment section and boom free access to MAPS Aesthetic. We also have a sale going on this month. Two programs are 50% off. MAPS OCR, 50% off, and MAPS Cardio, 50% off. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below to get yourself set up. All right, here comes the show. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you just made, reminded me. So I pick up my son the other day. I don't normally pick him up from school. And, uh, and I did, uh, just yesterday and I pick him up and he always normally has a few snacks or something like that left over. And, um, he had a banana in there. And so he, uh, he's, you know, I'm driving and I'm trying to, you know, peel the banana for him. And what made me think of this is I want to ask you guys this. So you can think about this while I'm telling the story of like, like little corks that your kids have that were, that are funny or like the way, the way they dress or they eat or they do certain things. And I wasn't aware of this, right? So this is how my learning experience as I'm driving. I peel the banana and then, you know, it's a big old banana. So I, I break it in half and I hand, I hand it back to him. Did he freak him. out? Oh, he flipped out on <laughs> You me. broke his banana. Bro. I, I didn't know what it what <laughs> was at first. And, and and then I think, oh, he wants the other one. So then give the other one. Nope. And he's yelling. So then he's getting it and he's in the back and he's getting so pissed because he can't fix it. He's trying oh, to, he's trying, trying to put it back together. Oh dude. So I'm driving trying to, and I'm trying to actually shove it back in the peel and then roll it back up. Get some and, tape. Yeah. And, and then I'm <laughs> having to hold it and it's falling over and stuff like that. And he's getting so pissed and I'm like, and I'm getting frustrated. I get home. I'm like, why did you tell me he eats his banana? Bro, that, by the way, that's not, a, that's not a weird thing that Max does. All kids right around that age. Like I know this cause I have uh, older yeah, kids. Yeah. If I give like a cookie or a treat to, mm -hmm. to my son, I know better than to break it off or ask him because they freak out. If you yeah. give them something 
and it's different than what they're used to. Yeah. Ah, uh -huh. yeah. They it hate it. Cause chaos. I mean, the only kind of definitive ones definitely has that like barrier. You know how you used to have like this food is right here and this corner doesn't touch this one. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. ever it's real particular about like if the foods touch or like the certain consistency. Yeah, Everett's a real picky eater, isn't yeah. he? I've ate with him before. There's been a few it's times rough, where yeah. you guys got to get him something else because, it, and it's even like textures of stuff, right? Like yeah. certain textures, he's like, it can't he's do that. Just, he's out before. I'm like, dude, and it's it literally just keeps constantly testing if I can like sell the idea. Yeah. And it's like like constantly trying to sell him the idea. Eat more protein, some eggs. Yeah. And like he's finally coming around, but it's, it's just a constant battle. Dude. Were yeah. you picky like that as a kid? I was uh, mainly with vegetables, like everything else. I ate so much meat. Like that was, I was just always about just eating meat. Um, but yeah, because of the way it was prepared though, I didn't realize that. Like I would have enjoyed it a lot more if they, the microwave didn't exist. <laughs> and you know, like Velveeta cheese. Were, you, was your, and, were your parents really disgusting. bad cooks? They really, your whole life like that? Oh, just like for vegetables, were the worst. Like uh, it was just everything. And my dad only would eat uh, iceberg lettuce and like carrot and uh, celery. That was like what he considered salad. I'm like, so this is like basically water. Uh, this is not even fiber. Yeah, it's not even. This is like you get water from this. Yeah, <laughs> like it's as much nutrients as you got in that yeah. salad. But yeah, it's it's between that and the, everything was overcooked and like kind of rubbery. So I didn't really know until I actually worked in a restaurant, you know, in college, and I got exposed to other types of salads and like the way that they cook asparagus. And I got into broccoli finally, which I never thought I would because I used to hide it. I used to like sit there at the d dinner table till everybody would leave. You have to finish your vegetables. You can't leave this Stick table. So pocket. I would stay there till everybody left. And then, you know, they, and every now and then they come in. And so I ended up start to hide it like around the Did room. You get caught? Yeah, I got caught because it rot. You know, yeah. like it was in like oh, a, in the a, room? a snow glove. I found a snow glove in the corner and I like would stuff it with like broccoli and like cauliflower. And, Bro, yeah. I, I threw food away once and that was like the worst, the worst beating. You know, it was so when I, when I was a kid, because I grew up, because I think when you're a kid, you often too want what you don't have, not realizing, maybe, maybe not appreciating. So I obviously, I had homemade cooked Italian dinners and they were for all intents and purposes, incredible. Yeah. But because that's all I knew, I would be jealous when I'd go to my friend's house and they would have like pizza or like McDonald's or something yeah. like, Oh my God, you're so lucky. This is like the best ever. I love McDonald's. You know, my mom, meanwhile, like was making delicacy, pasta yeah. and meat and you know, <laughs> yeah. all homemade, all bro homemade bread, you know, it was hilarious. Yeah. Speaking of kids, Aurelius is going through, I forgot about this uh, for a second, but then it's like, I looked it up. I'm like, Oh yeah. So you know how kids go through like uh, when they're real young, they go through what are called leaps where yeah. they go through sleep regressions yeah. or whatever. I forgot there's a big one right around two years old. So right right now. Well, it's a transition to going to toddler. Yeah. So yeah. right now my son's struggling with sleep. Now he's cool because he stays in bed, but we, we see him on the monitor. He's just up mm -hmm. and he's talking to his stuffed animals or, you know, he's just hanging out or whatever. <laughs> um, and, but, and he's also acting. Is, a he, bit. Uh, is he out of the crib? No, he's still in the crib. Oh, so you're still crib. Yeah, yeah, okay. He's still in the crib. All right. But he's 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 definitely testing things more. He's putting words and sentences together, three words, four words together. So, and I looked it up and it's the, his brain is making ridiculous connections right now, which means he's going to act a little, you know, he's going to act up a little bit. Yeah. He's not going to be sleeping as well. You're going to have more challenges around eating or whatever. I'm like, "Oh, this is perfect timing for us to have an infant." So, let's just <laughs> I hope he's right in the middle of this why when Jessica has the baby, it'll be great. You know, uh, I mean? you know, I really didn't think I was going to really like those apps as much as I do. I think that, um, they, they give you a little piece as a parent, as a parent. Like I know they're not perfect and exactly yeah. accurate to everyone, but they do a pretty good job they do. of communicating what the leaps and, and different challenges at that, those phases of their life are that when you're going through a time, it's definitely helped Katrina and I, even us communicating, you know, cause you're, you're all trying to figure it out. Like mm -hmm. He's trying to figure yeah. it out. You as as a, as a right. dad and a mom are trying to decide what is it. And when it's when they're struggling, it, you're struggling, and sometimes that can cause tension between all of yeah, you. You guys. don't know what's going on. Is he right. sick? What's That's going right. on? They can't communicate so or articulate it. We've leaned on that many times. Where if there's a moment where we like feel friendly, you know what? When was the last time we looked at the app and seen what it makes what, it big? And it's almost always it, right. It's been for us. It's been that yeah. way for us, dude. I looked been, it like, up. Spot on. I'm like, damn, that's exactly. Well, because Jessica and I were sitting there and we're like, is he? What's wrong? She's like, what's wrong with my kid? She's like, he's not. No, we didn't right. have none of that. Yeah, yeah I wish they would have that. Oh, yeah. She's like, he's acting up like something's not right. And I'm like, you know, he doesn't seem sick. Like, what's going on? I'm like, you know what? Let me look it up. And I looked it up. And one of the things it said on there, it said all the stuff that we were experiencing, but then also said, you may notice now 
that your child all of a sudden is scared of the dark because mm. at this age is when their imagination their imagination starts to run wild yeah. and they start to fear the dark. Sure enough, that's exactly what's happened with them. All of a sudden, if there, there's the dark living room over there yeah. and he goes, "Papa, no." And I'm like, "Why, buddy?" And he goes, "Dark. No dark. No dark." I'm like, "You don't want to go in there?" No. I'm like, "This is so weird. He's never scared before." And then yeah. you read the, you know, the app or whatever, yeah. it's like, "Oh, it's totally on point." Yeah. Speaking of kids, someone in our forum posted this video of this kid, probably I want to say 6 or 7 years old doing like a clean and snatch with the barbell. Good technique, good form. Uh-huh. But the 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 post was, do you guys think this is okay to have like a seven or eight year old lift weights? And I said, you know, and I commented underneath, this is huge misconception about, about strength training in kids. And I said, so long as their form and technique is good yeah. and they've got good control, it's as safe as playing sports. Yeah. Like nobody would question a seven year old playing soccer right. or baseball or basketball. But for some reason, when they lift weights, everybody freaks out. Yeah. And it's the same rules. Like if they do it right and they're not overdoing it and the technique is good, it's per not only perfectly safe, it's extremely valuable. For well, there kids. was this misconception. It was like stunt their growth <laughs> yes. or something. And uh, yeah, we no, need to do more work happen. in dispelling that because yeah, if they have proper technique and, and good form and they really learn like sound fundamentals, that's going to carry through the rest of their life better than anything else they can learn. So well, you it's can, like, why not start with that? I mean, you could make the case that it ha would actually have huge carryover into sport for them too at that Absolutely. young age general you can, strength training yeah oh my god if you can especially if you learn technique and form on something like a snatch like that that's a that's a very technical and type now, of you movement. know what the challenge is is, yeah. is making your kid do it because it's boring <laughs> yeah right it's not nearly as fun as playing a sport right. so that's why most kids don't do it is that it's not fun to get you know so when i see a video like that i'm like oh man yeah you can tell there's a, a difference like when a kid is doing it and they're into it and they're performing it and they're trying to work on yeah. it versus a parent trying to tell their kid yeah. hey you need to squat and put in barbell and that's not safe to me is loading a kid up with a yeah. barbell when they don't even want to be squatting and you're trying to tell them to squat like that not a safe idea yeah. well even more so since having the kids in gymnastics i see like the benefit of doing a little higher risk movements you know and like in terms of the, like the stress of it the complication of it like they're learning how to to operate their body and control their body at a higher level, which then translates to strength as well, because now they have more stability and control uh, in their movements. So if they go to pick something up, it's just like it's such a better looking uh, exercise that they can perform. But um, yeah, it's it's still like it's stressful for me because there's a high potential for injury flipping and then doing all these crazy That's true. stunts, yeah. you know, on that level. So what are we talking Isn't about? Isn't that yeah. funny how the yeah. myth just it continues to permeate? you know, with strength training? Well, there was a massive myth around it, though. They're like, they used to think that it like, they used to say it like, it would it damage the growth, growth plates. Yeah. And that, you know like, how much weight your kid would have to lift? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, you, <laughs> but happen. I mean, you hear that. I mean, it's hard to get rid of that thought. And every, we're all so protective of our children. And so, and they're like really jumping off our, the top of a, you know, a playground thing and hitting the ground is going to produce way more force on your growth plates than what your kid is going to squat with proper form. Yeah, you know, a, I mean, that's just a fact. No, that's a, that's a good point. Spe now, uh, uh, along the lines of children and stuff, I read something the other day I thought was crazy, crazy, but makes a lot of sense. So there's some research that is starting to show a potential correlation. So you guys are familiar with SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very sad, right? Your, yeah. your kid seems healthy well, or whatever. The worst, yeah. Then they just, you know, die in their sleep or whatever. And there's like, they're always trying to find connections. Like why, what is, what's going on here? What's happening? Well, there may be a correlation between circumcision and SIDS. What? B little boy, little baby infants getting circumcised and then SIDS. And I read why they think that, the, well, first off, they showed that there's a correlation in the data. So then what they did is they said, okay, let's try and find a potential cause. I did not know this. So an infant only has about 11 ounces of blood and they may easily lose one to two ounces in circumcision. That's the equivalent of two to four blood donations for an adult. Oh, interesting. Wow. That's interesting. Isn't that crazy? So well, let's say you, like you don't even although consider my, that. My son didn't you bleed at all when he when he did his. Well, that's very true, but sometimes they do. Oh, so that. And so they're showing God, that. That seems like such a leap, though. To, okay, so in, in that situation, they're showing that there, there may be some correlation. Well, there's literally only two options. Either they're circumcised or they're not. Yeah. So it's already a 50-50 shot that you can make that correlation. I mean, and that just that, basically there's a higher rate of SIDS. What would be more circumcised boys than uncircumcised? Right. That, that's and they're least, trying to figure out 
if it's that or if there's something else. Like now, our, what would be more interesting to me is to show, because I'm sure there are different, like when, when the kid does get circumcised, there are ones that do probably bleed a lot more than others. And if you could show like, oh, these ones that we had right. in, an abnormal amount of blood, they were they were 80% more likely to have SIDS than someone that either didn't have a circumcision or had no little to no blood. Like that to me would be a better. Do you guys know how big of a uh, how many how, how many less children uh, or babies getting circumcised today than when we were kids? It's a huge difference. Yeah, I know it's a lot. When like, we were, they try and talk you out of it like immediately now. Well, when we were kids, it was like eighty percent of boys were circumcised. Now it's like I don't know what it is now. 40 percent. It's dropped considerably. Hmm. Yeah, US, I think is- that's in, that's not still total. I think that's comparing like the the generation now. They have re- they've gone from. 80 to down to That's down I mean. 30% or what that, but I, no, I think it, it's total 30, 40% get circumcised now. Whereas when we were kids, you th- so you think, you think seven out of 10 kids are, are not circumcised. Yeah. Now? If I'm not mistaken, maybe Doug can look it up. Yeah, what the dude, trends a are lot now. Of anteaters out there. Man. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think, I, I don't think, I don't think so, dude. Not I do sure. know. I do yeah. know. And I have seen that it, it has completely changed from when we were little. It's a, it's a lot more, but I don't think it's that high, bro. Yeah, that, it, it's, I don't been, think it's, it's a big swing. I don't think it's 64% are, R. Okay. Yeah. And then and when we were kids it was eighty percent, if I'm not mistaken. That sounds more like okay. it. Yeah. That's still a big it's yeah, a still, huge drop. Yeah, no, it's well it's almost half now. Almost half yeah. or it's now almost a fifty fifty split. You think correlate to the drop in religion and yes. religious practices? Probably. Yeah. Pro- although, right. you know, the 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 uh, so Jewish religion, I think it's the only one that says that you should be circumcised, right? Yeah, I think so. I think by proxy, though. Um, Christians, Christians, it's not in the religion. It's but not in the religion, but it tends to be the practice. It was part of the culture yeah, for, for a little while. Yeah, it's really, I don't know. I don't know. Really interesting to me. But I mean, when I heard that with the blood and the data, I was like, oh shit, that's crazy to me. Yeah, Because yeah. one ounce of blood is nothing, but for an infant, yeah, for an infant. I yeah, mean, that, that makes sense, though. I mean, especially if you had a, a situation where they, well, I, like I said, I'd like to see the situations where they bled a little more than they're yeah. supposed to. And I wonder if there was like an even higher. And also, you may, that. look, you also may be like, okay, kids who get circumcised also tend to have parents that do this. You know, that's that's why they need to find that's why, yeah, it's a whole, that's why I said it's a big So it's leap. unknown. The, the, There's the a correlation. Infant, well, I'm just saying, like, uh, in terms of it being there, they suffocated or, you know what I mean, versus like it's it was something other physiological thing that happened that caused the death. They've made some other correlations too, like um, not breastfeeding, uh, uh, C-section, not sleeping skin to skin on mom or dad. You know, those are a few, but, but correlation is not No, I'm always, causation. So, correlation right. stuff is some, for me is such a reach. But the theory behind right. it was interesting. I mean, it obviously points in a direction we should look into it. Exactly. Right? And yeah, like yeah. pay attention. So I agree with that. Exactly. But to get too, too hyped up. Dude, on you guys it. want to hear a funny story that I read that was just, it's so hilarious. It happened back in 1908, but I thought it was the funniest thing I'd, I'd read in a long time. So there was this dog. I got to find out where it was. I think it was in England. There was a dog in England that got an award because it saved this child from a river. So the dog went in. So, oh, Paris. Sorry, this was in Paris. So this dog, it was a Newfoundland dog, heard a child screaming, and oh, the kid had fallen into the river Seine. The dog went in, found the per, the, the kid, pulled the kid out and saved the kid. And so they celebrated and gave this dog a big ass steak. Oh, that's rad. As part of the celebration, that's right? Cool. Well, <laughs> not that long after, the dog saved another kid from the river. And then another kid from the river. And you know what they found out? <laughs> the, dog, the dog was putting him in the river. The dog was pushing him. <laughs> <laughs> Good boy, good is boy. True? Bad dog. Is yeah. that true? Bad, bad dog. The dog. Hey, the dog was waiting because he got a steak. He got a steak. You know? So he just drops him. Yeah, bro, it. that's a true story? Yes. Oh, I, I read oh my God, dude. It, it got that's a, ridiculous. This dog got a steak, you know? So he's like. <laughs> he straight trained him to fucking, fucking yeah, the like, kids in the water. <laughs> so he would see. So they found. They were watching him like, what's going on here? Oh, then, my God. There'd be kids playing next to the river and he'd push him in. And then he'd jump in and save him. Oh, my God. <laughs> bad dog bro that's bad a dog. bad dog that's hilarious what do you do at that point you get oh mad or you're like oh, you know, no that's your bad you know, your dog, bad. No, yeah. exactly the dog was trained you trained him to do that they, well, they they say that right like uh always um like when a dog's misbehave so then that it's like uh you're getting trained or they're getting trained that's the yeah. such thing as a bad dog it's you either you're getting trained as the owner or you're training them as the owner so <laughs> no that's that's hilarious i mean that makes sense i, me. I have yeah. i have one for you guys so uh, last night katrina and i were doing um uh, I I love uh, John Deloney, our friend. Um, his, oh, he's such a good guy. His cards, 
he has those all those oh, cards. Like oh, we use those. The, yeah, the we use them all the time. Yeah. So Katrina and I will just be sitting there. And we'll, we'll pull them out. And so she pulled one out that I thought started a really funny conversation. So I'm going to ask you guys. So what is a white lie that you told that actually ended up getting you in big trouble or causing a, a big problem? Oh, I got to think Ooh. about that. Think of a, a, a white lie that you had you did and then ended up backfiring probably pretty big or ended up being bigger than what you I can't you think off the top of my head right now. <clears throat> but do you have a good one? Yeah, I'll tell you what happened. I'll tell you the one I shared with her uh, that it, it's, I mean, what I love about these things, it really does promote like having to think. Like you have to- It does, like, good like, discussion. Like, like hmm, let me think of a time where I, I'm sure that's happened. I'm sure I thought this, oh, no big deal. Let's lie about this. And then it was really bad because I did. So for me, the one that like jumped out was when I was a uh, I was in high school, and so I'm a I'm a junior junior or senior, and uh, no, I was a senior. And uh, Friday nights uh, after football games, we would go to the party, and it was and I'm sure you guys have done this before too, where you tell your parents that you're spending the night at Justin's house. Justin tells his parents he spent the night at Adam's oh, house. Yeah, out, yeah. So yeah. we're all lying about whose houses we're spending at so we can go out and be out at the party all night long. So my buddy, Justin, my cousin, Travis, and myself all did the little trifecta lie about, so who, who everybody's staying at each other's house, right? And that night we got in a car accident driving from one party to another, another party. And on top of that, it was, we were driving my cousin's uncle's classic Mustang. Oh, I remember this story. And I was driving it and I actually had had a beer. So I had one beer already. And I was so paranoid that I was going to get in trouble for driving that my best friend, Justin, who was in the backseat, who hadn't started drinking yet, took the fall and said that he sold, he told the cops that he was driving this whole situation. And so, of course, this one tiny little sm small lie ended up being this massive lie that not only did we lie to our parents, so I got in crazy trouble for that. We lied to my uncle about who was driving, so he was absolutely pissed. Like, who the hell is this random kid who's driving? Not only did, yeah, exactly. And then my best friend had to get up in court and lie that he was the driver and explain how he got into the accident when it was really me who was driving. So, oh, and you know, all from this <laughs> tiny little, oh yeah, we're spending the night over each other and it worked like all the time and we just thought nothing of it. It was no big I deal. I can think of one. I don't know why. I just, I just thought of this, yeah. but in high school. Uh, it's not really a white lie. It's just a lie. Yeah, that's a, that's a, <laughs> that wasn't real. Exactly. <laughs> that's a white lie. It's like, a, come yeah. on. Like you're spending the night. Like it's kind of semantics. We were spending the night somewhere. Yeah, I got Who's plenty of lies, dude. I'll, I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll open yeah. up about that. I'll give you a white yeah. lie. Okay. Okay. Uh, there was this kid in in high school, and he was singing. <laughs> he was singing one time by the bathroom or whatever. And uh, I kind of made like a comment, and he goes, "Oh, you like you like how I sing?" He's like, "I've been practicing or whatever." And I oh. like felt bad. And he sounded like shit, right? I'm like, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're pretty good. Yeah, you're good, dude. You're good, right? It's like a total white lie. <laughs> well, he did. The, he's at the school oh, uh, talent that. thing. He signed up to. Speak. He got up and he fucking sang, dude. And he sucked. <laughs> <laughs> and he was so embarrassed. And I felt dude, so bad. Sal really was popular, here, and he's a popular kid telling him that he was good. I should have told him afterwards. I should have told him the truth. Like, no, you suck, dude. You should never see in front of people <laughs> oh ever. Oh, God. That's the only one I could think of. <laughs> Off the top of my head. Yeah. Oh, so I, many lies for you. So give us one. Just really one. bad ones. <laughs> There's like, like acceptable. Well, the main lie that uh, I think always sticks out to me and is one that almost got me kicked out of my house uh, completely, which, you know, was something I was kind of like fighting anyway, because I was like off to college and I'm like, what do you mean kick me out of the house? I don't even live here anymore. Yeah. You know, but this was just like a principled thing. Like me and my dad always fought about uh, tattoo, tattoo and, yeah. and just about like, you know, different passages and like. So they leaned on the heavy conservative side. I was like, you know, what inspired me with, and you guys know how I'm into all these crazy weird bands and all that is because it was like an outlet for me. And there was like a sub genre within, you know, the, the church where I could like feel like I'm kind of a rebel, yeah. you know? And so I was like all drawn to tattoos. So I was in a Christian college and uh, I actually went with some of my friends and, and was just like, you know what, whatever, I'm going to get my favorite band of tattooed on my arm like it's I'm, I'm on my own i'm living on campus like whatever dude i know my dad's gonna hate this no big deal and then i get it done and we come back for thanksgiving and uh like it's kind of poking out of my shirt like right here and my brother of course sees it at first and he wants to throw me under the bus and roast me and i'm just like i'm like oh so i just i i had some like markers and I was like drawing other stuff on my arm to, to make, like, it, look like it, was make it look like it was all just, just scribble <laughs> <laughs> you didn't think that out 
<laughs> they're gonna find out pretty soon. No, I actually it was like it was like gonna go with like henna tattoo, or I was just gonna go yeah. with like I was just doodling, you know. And so I was like made this whole like crazy <laughs> stupid design on my arm with like a, a magic marker. <laughs> and uh, so, anyways, like it just he came me this kind of skeptical look. Like, is there more? Is there more there? I'm like, no, 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 it's nothing. And then he found out and he pulled my arm all the way up and then was like, and then we had slapped across your face. Yeah, we had a moment. <laughs> we had to we had to work through it, the counseling, all that stuff. But wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And with that, so here we are today. Hey. Uh, <laughs> it's, everything's fine. You got that big in trouble? <laughs> I got it. We hired trouble, a therapist, dude. son. Yeah. Exactly. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah, That's was, a good time. What about you, Douglas? It was a big one. Yeah, I'm sitting here trying to think of one and I'm having a hard time. I feel like any white lie I've said is probably more like what Sal did is like complimenting somebody on somebody's <laughs> fishing for a compliment. Those are, good, like, those are funny yeah. white lies. It's like, good. Yeah. It's like, you know, somebody asking, uh, do I look fat? Oh no, no, you don't. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that's probably what I've done. I don't know if there has been a negative consequence because of it, but uh, you, you, you didn't tell that to a past girlfriend. And then she put 50 more pounds on because you told her she looked. Actually, in fact, you're actually too skinny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh really? Oh, yeah. Damn it. <laughs> yeah. Does this look good on me? Uh, oh yeah. It looks great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, or you, you know what you know you don't have any white lies, Adam, because you either lie or you don't. I don't think you do a white lie. If someone asks you a question, if yeah, I'm feel pretty, nice, you'll yeah. just tell them. Yeah, no, I'm, do I look fat in this? Yes. Yeah, no, I, I, you're right. I think I, I, I guess that to me seemed like a white lie then because it was we had done it so many yeah. times. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like the common behavior, like, hey, you know, it's Friday night. You say you're at my house. We all say that, and then we, we sleep wherever we we end up, and it was something we always did. Yeah, so I sure. thought it was kind of. I don't know if that's categorized as a, a white lie, but it's like, to me, it was so no big deal, but turned into be like one of the biggest deals yeah. ever. One of the first you gotta, I mean, you have to be careful because it could bite you back. Like I remember telling one of my friend's moms, I'd eat over there sometimes. She made this dish and I'm like, oh, it's so good. And of course she made it every fucking time when I went there <laughs> and I didn't like it. Yeah. So I had to eat it every yeah, single time. I've learned not to There's do an, that. I, you know what? Here's one. It's not really a white like, lie. Mm, this is more of like me. a, this is more of like a, like I didn't say anything. There's this this woman that I used to work with, and she said my name, and this happens every once in a while. She said my name Saul instead of Sal. Sometimes that happens. Someone says Saul, right. and I'll correct them. Oh, no. you didn't correct. You and I say no, no, it's Sal. And then she kept saying Saul. And then mm. I said no, no, it's Sal. And then she kept saying Saul. And I stopped correcting her. Well, anyway, I knew this one for like two years. <laughs> Never told her, by I never fixed it. Yeah. So I just, I was Saul to her. Yeah. And then one day there were other people talking and she's like, Sal? She's like, is that how you say your name? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> she's, like, it's, she's like two years, yeah, two years oh, later. That reminds me. Yeah. Cause so this one client I had just it, for some reason in her head, I told her I played college football. And so she's, you know, I was like, first I was at San Jose State. Then I went to Trinity and um, for some reason she thought like I had said Oregon like, like a long time ago. And I'm just like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And like, I reaff reaffirmed it for her one time, not even like catching it that yeah. she said Oregon instead of like, and so like later on, she's like introducing me to somebody that played there. <laughs> like, did you have like, a Mr. Smith? Yeah, like, like, like naming, yeah, yeah, the coach and like other players. And I'm just like, yeah. And I'm like, wait, what school do you think I went to? Yeah, <laughs> yeah those I'm are like, good. Those are good white lie examples like, for sure. Well, yeah. you know, what's a common white lie that I do is if I'm, if somebody knows me, I'm so bad. Sometimes with faces and names, like uh, they'll come up, Sal. Hey, do you remember that? Whatever. Like, yeah, yeah. I don't remember anything, bro. I have no idea who you are. <laughs> now anybody who's going to run into you. can you. say anything, and I'll say yeah. Because it's just uncomfortable for me. <laughs> I don't want to be like, no, I don't remember yeah. you. And to do the back and forth. So I'll just be like, yeah, I remember you. I think that's the I remember you. I think that's, that's a common one. That oh, that's a terrible one. Anyway, I got this cool article um, to change gears here on AI-generated music. Did you guys know that the Recording Industry Association of America is actually trying to figure out legislation to protect against this in Ooh, the future? Explain this uh, again. So AI, artificial oh, intelligence. Oh, so basically to protect, I know we knew this was coming. How do you protect, uh, let's just say like someone who has such an iconic voice, like a Michael Jackson, yeah. right? From AI reproducing it themselves and then you selling it as if because it's it's not him anymore it's now this artificial intelligence but yeah. they can do such a good job of mimicking well, they do a blend of that like right. james brown and they just yeah. kind of mash it all well, yeah because there's these right now we have these what are called ai music generators 
that'll that'll that are able to make music and so they're like holy shit so basically what they said is they said yeah what a trip so the, the, they, they issued a statement condoning the use of ai music generators so online services that use ai to extract or rather copy the vocals instrumentals or some por portion of the instrumentals from a sound recording to generate master or remix a recording to be very similar to or almost as good as reference tracks by select well-known sound recording artists are infringing on its members' rights by making unauthorized copies of our, do you of know our members' what, works. Do you know what this reminds me of, Sal? It reminds me of the des designer steroid market. Oh. So can you not see that this is going to be the hustle of the future is to take a hit song and then to use artificial intelligence to change it by a molecule, yeah. change it by a tune, just a little. Like you remember yeah. when uh, Vanilla Ice went through that whole thing with uh, the original oh, people. Was it Sting? No, I forget uh, who who the original. The original. Remember, remember that clip of Ding Ding is yeah. under pressure. Dun 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 dun, 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 and he changed it to dun 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 dun. Yeah, he had like two. Yeah, it was like, but it was enough to keep. By the make, way, I, him explaining it. Remember there was that interview where he's trying to explain yes, why he wasn't. Yes, yes. He's like, no, no, no. Mine no, goes. Mine yeah, ding, there's his den, 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 den. Mine is den, 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 and it's not exactly the same. Yeah. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. That's the way theirs goes. Ours goes ding, 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 diggy, ding, 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 diggy, ding, ding. That little bitty change. It's not the same. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's what made me think of it. So that is gonna be. Was it Shug Knight that like uh, came and shook him up about it? So, held him over the balcony. Like over the balcony. Yeah. That was Vanilla Ice. Did that too? Yeah, he did that to him too. <laughs> he did. I know he did to multiple guys. Yeah, well, was, yeah. I don't remember. Was, it was Vanilla that was Ice. Kind of his move. But okay, do you get where I'm going though with this? Yeah. Like that is going to be. Imagine what a hustle that is going to be, and it's still going to. It's probably going to be able to get through all these loopholes because no matter how much they legislate and protect and say, okay, you can't have a part of song, you can't have this, you can't have this. All you would need is someone to just barely change. You know what? A though? little bit of everything like that, and then what's well, to stop them? It's crazy because I mean that's every artist is inspired by other music totally. right and and that's and you're kind of brought up it's it's a weird thing because like i i don't know i got kind of got back into like just making my own music and sounds and everything and like you you start to remember you're like oh my god this is from that song and then you're like you try to like self-regulate uh, on, on some level it's like this sounds way too similar to like something i've heard and this but then it ends up blending a lot so it's really hard to like Unless it's like super obvious, right. I, I feel like it. Whatever, it's a it's a creative uh, interpretation. You know, you, you know what though? The, the days of, uh, I mean, they're trying to fight the inevitable. At some point, yeah, yeah that's AI is going to generate brand new music. It's just going to happen, and it's going to it's going to because it's AI, it's going to figure out what lights up the brain the best, what produces the best serotonin and, and dopamine hits, and what's got the most catchy, like what makes things catchy. It's going to all become Math and formulas, and so, AI is going to make music that's going to crush. Okay, yeah. I agree, but I also still, I actually think this is going to elevate, okay, the music industry, and hear me out. Like, I think that you're right, and I think that that is going to be a big portion, let's say, of the, the music space. It's going to be this AI-generated type shit, mm -hmm. right? And I say shit because what it won't have is that emotion and feeling and, like, and energy from, like, fucking brilliant people that like pour their heart into the song and they do it. And I think that's what's going to, you're going to have like mostly AI stuff because it'll, it'll solve the Maybe. basic club bouncing around music that you don't really, but then the, 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 the like elite elite will still be able to separate themselves. I don't know. From because AI. That's what I, I think. Yeah, I don't know. Because interesting co conversation to me. Cause like I, I've noticed recently the music I'm most drawn to, it's not the high produced music. We've been getting so much of that over the years to where everything's in the recording studio. It's like everything's tracked on track, on track, on track. But like there's not a lot of garage bands. There's not a lot of like just, you know, uh, somebody with an instrument in the you know, acapella type stuff. right? Yeah, but just like raw. Like, that's, see, that's the thing, though. We think and maybe we're right. Maybe we're wrong that there's a magic involved. But maybe these AI machines can break down the formula. Yeah. And literally make something that's I, irresistible. I, so I think they will. Sure. Okay, so how how long until there is it, music is no longer okay, so making money because it, everybody has their it, own it AI will, generator? Though. It will. There'll still be. Okay, so AI will will be able to break down the formula of like what beat with what time in between to what pitch to like this to get like the to invoke this type of feeling that we you all. You know what like. it's gonna be like? It's gonna, be like, it's gonna cover eighty percent. 
But then there's going to be that gap for that that magical special voice or person that, and it will only be in that moment. It won't be pre-recorded track, edited up stuff. It'll be that improv. Yes, you know what it's that, be? that we'll be drawn to, yeah. and we will be able to, and we as humans because it'll be able pick to, up on our heartbeat. That's right. And we'll, like our, we will be able to senses, sense yeah. the difference between that and that, and that will make that more valuable. Because it's so rare, but for the most part, we listen to a lot of this stuff. I agree with you for different reasons, not for that, because I think the computers will be able to figure that out. I think we it'll be because of the story behind it. For example, classic cars. Okay, if classic cars didn't have the story behind them and the history, yeah. in reality, they're just pieces. Okay, of so shit. I, yeah. I they are like drive an old car. Hey, I know you can't separate. They're the rough. Two. I agree. You're right. You can't separate. It's going to be the story. You're going to know the story of That's that right. that person, what they went through, what they came through, and when you're listening to and them, it's sing, a human. Yes, and, it's a person. and then you're going to connect yeah. to how they are coming through in the right, song, right. and they won't be able to replace that. Right. But what's and that's why I think it'll elevate the music industry because now all this, all these fucking artists that are all auto tuned and and they just do they rip some else's music and make it kind of and like are just like they're talented at doing that shit but they're not like this pure it's going to be this kind of shelf life It'll, yeah, it's like the sure. same reason why i like old dungeon gyms not because their equipment's better it's usually not better it's yeah. just feeling in the in the story behind the gym that i'm in you know so i like the classic car example because yeah. when you ride in one unless you appreciate class it's really just a shitty car like it's bumpy <laughs> it's loud you gotta do this to open the window Can't turn it real well it breaks I, down all the time bro just driving my dad's car for uh <laughs> yeah. hottest nights and then like pulling up just because of the elevation and coming off of the freeway and then like idling just just too long uh and the fan didn't kick on properly <laughs> yeah. like it was i'm in this plume <clears throat> yeah. of steam and it's just like Oh yeah, that happens. Yeah. You know, All right, I, I, I got to switch gears here because I want to ask you guys a question about personal training certifications. I think that they're. I think a lot of them are missing out on some big, big components. What do you guys think is one of the main things that they miss out on? Well, I'll, I'll tell you the number one thing for me is what it's what um, it's why I had success as a a manager at Twenty Four Hour Fitness was because nobody's was nobody was teaching these trainers how to build a business. That's it. Yep. When I they teach I mean, you the was, training part, but I, nothing. About I tell this. I actually talk about this when I do like the NCI uh, coaching, and I tell them that like I was not a very good trainer. I had many trainers that worked for me that were far more intelligent, that had way more experience. They were better trainers than me. Uh, just when it came down to nutrition, biomechanics, anatomy, physiology, they they just they were on another level of experience and knowledge than I was. But what I saw was the ability to help these trainers build a business because none of the certifications, the degrees they all had were not in that, you know, yeah. they, it was, they, and they had no clue on really how to scale and how to, even how to like it set out like a business plan into like a whole like second half of education. Yes. You know, there was like that whole time period where. I was like, man, I wish I was doing this at the same time of of learning what I was learning in school in terms of like kinesiology and all that. The application part just wasn't there, man. I was I'm a very hands on and it's a hands on business. Look, like if you, one if you, to one. If you can't build a business, you can't help people. You can't train people with fitness. This is so NCI has is a big part of what they do with their certifications is teaching coaches and trainer how to build business, how to make money doing this. So you could actually do this uh for a living. And that happens to be the most popular part of their certification. That's the part that most of the coaches and trainers. Well, it helps them make because nobody else, yeah. nobody else does it. Well, and you, what the reason why that's so important is many trainers that work for me that were uh, brilliant and talented didn't make it because they couldn't run a business. That's mm -hmm. right. I mean, I don't, you, 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 you think it's when no you get joke. into the, the, the space that, oh, if I'm just the most educated, the most knowledgeable, I have all the answers for everybody and people like me, I'm going to, I'll be the most, one of the more successful trainers. And unfortunately it doesn't work that way. You, you quickly find out that there's a lot of marketing and selling and, you know, learning how to organize, set a business plan, set goals for yourself. Like there's a lot more that goes into being very successful as a trainer. And if you're all focused on just the educational and you miss out on that business part, many times you, you won't make it. Majority of times. Yeah. Check this out. Home gyms are awesome, but they take up a lot of space and the quality often isn't that great. Well, there's a company called PRX Performance that makes commercial grade workout equipment that is also designed to maximize space in your home. For example, they have a squat rack that literally folds up into the wall and it comes off the wall by, by, by about four inches. Okay. Four inches off the wall. That's how much space it takes. Then when you're ready to use it, you pull it off the wall. It, fold, it unfolds. Super stable. I've loaded up to 600 pounds on this thing and it's actually more stable 
than the squat racks I've used at the commercial gym. It's incredible, but they have lots of equipment. They have plates and barbells and dumbbells and cables and all kinds of great stuff for your home. Go check this company out. Go to prxperformance.com forward slash mind pump. And on that link, we'll get you'll get 5% off uh, their products. First caller is Simon from Manitoba. Simon, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey there. Uh, first of all, just want to say, uh, really enjoy listening to you guys, poc- uh, listening to your podcast and everything. It's helped me a lot in forming a solid workout routine. And just to kind of give all the background. So I've been training full body three times a week for at least two years now. And I've learned a lot of workout stuff from y'all and incorporated that into my workout routine. Uh, recently, I heard uh, Sal mention Eugene Sandow, and he was an 1800 strongman. Now, I'm a big strongman fan. I love watching Brian Shaw, Eddie Hall, and all those guys. So having to hear that you that there was a strongman in the 1800s got me curious. So I started doing some research on Eugene Sandow, who was very impressed by his strength and his physique and his amazing mustache. <laughs> Knowing that he also uh, did full body workouts gave me confidence that I'll be able to reach my strength goals with full body workouts as well. <laughs> so recently, I decided that I wanted to try, uh, try and work out like an 1800 strongman. The question being, uh, what are the fundamental building blocks for training like an 1800 strongman or is even training like an 1800 strongman a good idea? Wow. I love this question because (laughs) first off, to answer that last part, yes, it's a great idea. You got to consider sometimes where you get, where people get their advice from. And a lot of the fitness advice that we hear out there in modern times comes from people that are very different from us, both genetically, they're, they tend to be pharmaceutically enhanced. And so it's hard to apply their training principles to, let's say if you're like most people, like 99% of us kind of average people in the, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, they didn't even have supplements. I mean, let alone anabolic steroids. Um, and it, you know, how they looked was not nearly as important as what the kind of performances they could display and how they built a living. And old time strongmen are different than, than strongmen today. Strongmen today, it's very, you know, kind of, uh, you know, it's a regulated sport. There's specific lifts, there's competitions. Back in those days, they would do these performances and then they would challenge each other to different lifts. So you'd get like one strongman, he'd be really popular in one area and then there'd be another strongman from another area or maybe from Europe and then they'd cross paths and then they'd do these competitions to see who was stronger or sometimes they'd wrestle or arm wrestle or they would do a particular lift. So it's really cool history and really, really cool to learn about their training methodologies. And you and there's books. There's books that were written by them or about them that you can find. I'm trying to think of the website uh, where you can find some of these books. I think oh, it's called- Talk about this all the time. Old, I think it's called Old Time Strongman Old time or something strongman, like that. Old Time Strongman, yeah. Um, and you'll find some of their- there's, a, there's another book called Dinosaur Training, which is a more modern book, but it borrows on some of their training uh, principles. But you could narrow it down to something like this. So they trained- uh, typically three days a, w- a week, they trained lifts and not body parts. So they didn't think about shoulders, chest, arms, that kind of stuff. It was more about like, let me get good at these particular feats of strength. They didn't train to failure. In fact, most of those books uh, from back then talked about um, training hard, but making sure that you could train hard again in a couple days um, or not overexerting yourself. They would say stuff like that. So Kind of like what we talk about where you train intensely, but you're not out there maxing out and killing yourself um, every single time. Um, They did lots of isometrics, partials, and holds. So like uh, if somebody was going to perfect an old time lift, like a bent press, they might start by extent, you know, getting underneath a weight and seeing if they could just hold it straight up or doing like some kind of a partial lift to build uh, their strength up. They, They practiced lifts. Uh, meaning they they would practice the lift over and over again rather than like training uh, to get fatigued uh, or tired. Um, they uh, they ate diets that were typically heavy in full fat cream, mm-hmm. milk, like eggs. cholesterol. They would add in there. yeah, lots of meat, you know that kind of stuff. Um, they would throw in carbohydrates in, in there as well too. But they would talk about like you know eggs, meat, and and full fat cream was kind of you know and, and organ meats. Do you remember how many? Uh, strongman type lifts that we built in map strong. I know we have the circus press in there. I know we have a windmill in there. What else do we have? Did we, did we do a bent press in there? I don't know if we did a bent press. I don't think so. No, we didn't um, do a bent press. Yeah. They, they were really big on overhead anything. So any kind of overhead press, that was like the ultimate 
display of strength. Like rounded back lifting. Yeah, I like lifting you these count other that in there. Uh hip thrust type lifts. They would call it like a hip hoist. Um there were a lot of competitions to see. Some of them will lift like a horse, mm-hmm. you know, in, in in that kind of a lift. Um and it was just really about what you could do. You know, Eugene Sandow's good. You could look up um uh, Hackenschmidt, I think his last name was George Hackenschmidt. That's where they got the hack machine, hack machine from. What was the one they did with the barbell where they would start on one side and then two hand under it? Yeah, yeah. The anyhow, anyhow, that's right. Two hand anyhow. Um, that's a great lift. I'm trying to think of another. The mighty Adam, I think, was this guy's name, and he was like a small dude that was like super strong. Um, so really cool. You could find information on these guys. And, you know, train the way that they did. And uh, like I said, there were no supplements, there were no steroids, and it was, uh, it was about competing and who could lift more. Some of them developed bodybuilder like physiques for the day, like Eugene Sandow is the statue that you'll win for the Mr. Olympia. But some of them, you know, were just kind of thick. Um, A lot of them, I mean, very impressive looking if you, if you look at some of those old pictures. So I think would I you think, consider Charles Atlas one of them? I know he was big in isometrics, but he was he later. later. Yeah, but, he was later on. Yeah, but I think the I think the question that probably Simon's trying to get at right now is like, how would you program? Because a lot of these are are not traditional lifts where you fatigue a specific muscle, and there's more things like bent press and Turkish yeah. get ups and yep. these. How would you guys program that? Or do we have something that would look similar to that and you would just maybe exchange some of these exercises? It's like skills training, I would say. Like even if, I know we kind of did this in our small kettlebell program that we did with kettlebell for aesthetic where it was like you had days where it was just devoted to skills. You pick a a certain type of a lift, you refine it, you don't put a lot of intensity around it, but it's all about the frequency of the practicing. Um, And so I would would do that with, especially like a bent press, you know, any, any of these like, real unique lifts like you just need a lot of exposure to it honestly the program that we have that mimics old classic uh strongman type training the most is actually maps anabolic especially phase one Mm -hmm. even though the exercises are more traditional in there like bench press and rows and overhead press and squats the way especially phase one was laid out was heavily inspired by the way that they trained uh, back in those days. Our MAP Strong program is more on modern strongman training also very effective I mean it'll, it'll also build uh, incredible strength. But I mean, the principles that I gave you is really what you want to kind of stick to with your training. Do you have any of our programs, by the way, Simon? No, I, I got nothing. Okay. I just kind of recently started listening to y'all. So I'm just kind of, yeah, learning all the things. I, I say starting with, starting with anabolic, have Absolutely. Doug send him anabolic. So he has that. So you can see kind of how that's laid out. And then even though he's looking at really, really old men, I think strong would be a potential one for you to go into. After I think that. Uh, strong in performance. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. performance uh, is so movement focused that even though performance is more about modern athletics, it's going to make you better at if you want to practice odd lifts, you know? So I would say anabolic to start with, and then you got strong and performance later on. Yeah. Probably pretty good. I like that. Does, that. does that help answer your question a little bit? Yeah, just because like what I'm doing right now is with my full body stuff. I'm doing like every, like one each body part gets an exercise and I do three of those. And sometimes that goes for a whole hour more. So I'm just like, I made it up on the spot, just kind of like by listening to y'all and looking up stuff, but I don't know, like it's been working, but I don't know if it's the greatest thing. So it's working because you've got the big rocks out of the way. What you just said is really basic, but fundamental. Uh, but maps anabolic is, uh, I think you'll get blown away by, by the results you get from that program. Cause it's much more specifically, you know, program. So we'll send that over to you, Simon. Follow that. And oh, then, sweet. Yeah. And then, and then uh, Dinosaur Training. Check out that book. on. You can buy that on Amazon, I think. It's got some pretty cool okay, stuff uh, to read about. Okay. I'll look up Dinosaur Training then. All right. Cool. cool. Thanks, thanks for calling in. Sweet. Thank you so much. You got it. Yeah. I remember <clears throat> when I discovered like the old books of the way that they used to train. Oh, I forgot to tell them. They did lots of grip training. I forgot to say that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I, you know, when I found those old books, it was like, you know what I felt like? You know, in the movies when they're like looking for like an ancient book with wisdom and it's like, like <laughs> I felt like that. Like I opened them and I'm like, oh my God, this is so. All these secrets. All these, like we forgot. It's you know? funny. I felt like you came to that, um, that place through a different pathway, but I came there through unconventional interests. Like, so I was into all the unconventional yeah. lifts and then it just kind of like traces it back to some of those old time strongmen who would uh, perform these feats of strength and hold like benches of people over yeah, their head. And, yeah. You know, cool shit like that. Like I was always into. To that. I wonder if there's a big enough need in our audience to actually write something like that because we, I mean, I know we have things that like maps you said, old time, something like that. Yeah, like, that is literally like, like 
all those lifts. Forget anything else. It's like literally designed. Bro, like, that would be so fun to write. I would love it. I would, I would, yeah, love I would creating do it. it. I don't know if there'd be a market demand yeah, for it. Yeah, I don't know if there's enough it. of a demand for yeah. it. That's the first time we've ever had somebody call in and actually specifically want something just like that. It, right. would, it would be fun to write. And I just think there's- You've tried to sprinkle little bits of it in. The I know. That's. I was like thinking of all the programs. Like, well, we have put this there, but I'm like, damn, that's like in that one. And then we have that in performance. It's like, we have bits of all that stuff in different programs, but yeah. we haven't like written one that's just for that. I mean, if you look at some of the pictures of these guys like doug i don't know if you could look up george hackenschmidt uh but if you look at some of the pictures of these guys from back then and you and they then were you real, impressive and then you realize like they had full-time jobs they probably worked manual labor <laughs> yeah, they weren't dying to, they weren't even dying to be lean they didn't do yeah. any i didn't know I mean, it wasn't even important to them and you know they it was like a pastime that they would do mm -hmm. they didn't take supplements and you look at these guys you're like holy and then you hear the feats of strength like i think eugene sando did a like a bent press with 300 pounds click on that mm -hmm. top left one doug I mean, look, first yeah, of all, he's a beast. Look at this guy. I mean, he just, he's, he looks like a moose. <laughs> <laughs> look at the size of the guy's neck. He ain't all shredded, but he's a beast. I mean, just, you know, and it, like I said, the feats of strength are just so imp impressive. Next caller is Jeff from California. What's up, Jeff? How can we help you? Hey, hey, I just want to say thank you to uh, Kermit. Uh, uh, pudgy to ripped, <laughs> bedazzled badge, and yeah. the Doug. You've been listening for wow. a while. You went back to OG, the old one. dude. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I started listening during the uh, bat soup disease time, but uh, I've listened to so many that uh, I've had to go. I had to go dig deep into the old ones. <laughs> wow. I like Jeff a lot already. You're a, All right, you're a good man. <laughs> so, um. My question is, uh, I went and got my uh, testosterone and everything tested, and uh, it came out to like 360, which I thought was pretty low. Um, and before I went and did like TRT or whatever, um, I want to ask you guys what you thought about uh, supplementing for this um, before I go the TRT route, um, specifically like. Uh, what is it? Uh, I'm gonna screw these names up so bad, but like um, Long Jack or Tongue Cat Ali, yeah, Tongue Cat Ali, and yeah, Fenugreek, um, Fagoe or Fagoa Agrestis, uh, Sheila G, you know, supplements like that. Like, what am I gonna get the most benefit from for raising my testosterone? Um, because I wanna, I wanna perform at my best, you know, just like anybody else. Okay. So, um, all the ones you mentioned have some, some clinical evidence. I've actually used all of them, but before we get to supplements, um, there's a couple questions I have. Do you know what your baseline total t testosterone was before? In other words, you said it was, th uh, it sounds like total testosterone 390 something. Now, do you know what it was when you were, let's say in your early thirties or anything like that? I, I don't. This is the first time I've ever checked it, and it was a. It came out to three sixty or okay. three sixty one or something like that. And um, and oh, and I wanted to add it like you know my sleep is good, my diet's good, my proteins up. I take ashwagandha every day. It's, you know, I'm like I've like I said, I've been listening to you long long enough to where I've checked all those boxes. Um, and um, yeah, just when I got the total testosterone of three sixty, I was like, well, that seems pretty damn low um and and uh yeah i just feel like i've i've kind of hit like uh a wall okay. with training and everything and um i've done uh i started with performance because i'm a carpenter and a rock climber so that seemed the most logical and then i went on to aesthetics and then i did anabolic and now i'm back on performance and uh all the all the weights that i started with uh prior with performance i'm doing the same weight and it doesn't feel like i'm able to increase like i'm not maybe getting stronger do you, did you notice any like um recent changes in energy strength and libido or is this is it kind of do you feel like you just got low testosterone now if you look back are you able to make that speculation i would say it's probably been the same maybe okay. So here's a tough thing with now your total testosterone is definitely on the lower end of what the, what would be the scale that they would use as a reference, mm -hmm. the, especially for a guy with good diet and lifting too. Yes. Yeah, so the challenge is this, is that it's usually, you know, if it gets really low, then that's different. But if it's low plus symptoms, 
we don't know what your baseline was, so that kind of make it difficult um, to judge. And also, androgen receptor density plays a bigger role than total testosterone. So they did this study on men to see how much testosterone plays a role in building muscle. And they had some men with like 500, some men with 900, you know, total. And the men with higher androgen receptor density had a bigger impact, meaning, uh, you know, more, more available androgens. So, so just testosterone levels alone is, is kind of hard to read unless it gets too low. And, but if it's accompanied by symptoms, then you kind of want to look at that. Now, supplements can help, but it's not going to make typically a huge impact. Um, there, there's a company that uh, we just had somebody on the show talking about testosterone boosters and uh, you can find yeah. it online stronger by science. He works with a company called joy mode and he went through their products and basically approved, you know, whatever they're selling or not, or, and helped them formulate it. So I trust his opinion cause he's one of the go-to guys. So joy mode, I think would have a good testosterone booster, but you know, what's that going to do? 30% raise maybe 20, 30%. So it's not going to make like this huge boost. So I, I could, you could try the supplement. You could also <laughs> test to see if you have any nutrient deficiencies, um, like mm -hmm. vitamin D or zinc. Although joy mode, I believe has zinc in it and, and some other nutrients that sometimes are low in men that can make a big impact. So I would take it yeah. for 30 to 60 days. I would make sure I got really good sleep. I would reduce my volume and intensity with my training and then get retested see where you're at. And if, if it's not that much higher, then you could talk to a hormone specialist and there's two routes. One is to go exogenous testosterone. The other is to try medications to boost your testosterone, then to see if it'll stay that way. Like so HCG. Like, yeah. Like HCG. And I mean, he's, he's really where, where you're at, Jeff is actually really similar to where I was at not that long ago. Right. So he's similar in age. Uh, <coughs> naturally my, mine was actually two something. So I was a little bit lower than you were. I, I did all the ashwagandha. I did the tongue cat Ali. I did the, That's uh, right, you did all that you, stuff. I did all that stuff and I did feel a little <laughs> bit, a little bit better from it. Not very much though. Not like where I had felt in my, in my like twenties and early thirties. And so I did that for almost a year trying to bring it up naturally. And I felt like I made a little bit of a movement in like to, to Sal's point. Like I felt like it got a little bit better, but it still didn't feel like I used to feel like. And that's what made me go eventually to TRT. And that and then of course once I got on TRT, it was, you know, a game changer. I think a lot of times too, people, especially in like the 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 you know, competitive bodybuilding lifting world, like they they say TRT and then they're on these crazy super physiological doses where you don't need that much. Like I take a very mild dose, but it makes me feel absolutely amazing. And so if you've exhausted all your resources, as far as like trying to do it naturally, and you've been consistently doing that and you feel like diets in check, sleeps in check. I mean, you're, you're a classic example of somebody that I would push in the direction of our uh, MP hormones. Yeah. I would go that, that route and, mm -hmm. and at least get a consultation by the doctor and have him uh, talk Some to blood you. Blood work done. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's, you know, you're over 40, you've got kids, already like you're, mm -hmm. you're in that age group where if trt um is what you need then it's then it's all good you're not you're, you know versus like a, you're in your 20s you don't have kids you know that can be a little bit more of a risk. yeah we just had somebody the other day that was like 27 that actually said kind of same thing and we actually pushed him the opposite we pushed him over to cabral and said go go do all this testing first like i would yeah, be especially more especially when you're that young yeah but at 41 and healthy and eating right and sleeping right yeah i would do like i would do like 60 days jeff of you know, trying some of the test boosters, making sure that you're, you're, you drop your volume, you're, you're eating adequate calories, that your sleep is good. You're getting sunlight, doing all this stuff. Um, and then see how much it changes, if at all. And then from there, mm -hmm. um, you know, and you could work with the, the doctors at mphormones.com throughout this process. And then they'll test, they can, you can get tested again. And then you could try, like, if you don't want to go on testosterone, you could try, you know, and this again, this is with doctor's uh, approval and supervision, but I think they do like Clomid and HCG and sometimes that does it. And then, and then guys testosterone's up and then they can maintain it. And other times they need to go on uh, testosterone. So it's not as easy as like, uh, you know, just do this. You know, I think there's a step-by-step -step process, right? unless you just want to go on testosterone because you're like, I don't want to try all that. And I just want to feel better. In which case, you know, then uh, again, you could tell, tell the doctors, uh, uh, you know, mphormones.com. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as far as the, uh, uh, the supplements are the, uh, and, and of course, uh, the Eric Trexler, you know, recommendation, um, do, I mean, do I just try any of these or specific ones or I would go just kind of keep it simple. So the company that he, uh, specifically, um, works with is, uh, right. joy mode and their website, Doug wrote it up. It's use 
joymode.com forward slash mind pump. And then mm -hmm. you, if they have a testosterone booster there that he designed, um, just try that one. Yeah. First. Try it and then get another test. Um, and then see if, yeah. you know, what kind of an impact it has. And most importantly, how you feel, to be honest with you, because yeah. one of the Symptoms things, yeah. the other part, one of the things I've learned from the doctors, from all the testing back and forth I've done is he's like, you know, you can sometimes see somebody who their numbers will elevate to say four, say we bring yours up to four fifty, but if you still feel you know, like your your energy level is low, your strength is down, your libido. Right. If, if you're if the symptoms are still there, he would say that you're still considered low because it's such a wide range. So really, true. Uh, how you feel, yeah. wh where you're at, that's what I would I would be trying to judge that more than actually a number, right? Because you might even be able to take these supplements and get it up to say 450. Um, but if 450 doesn't make you feel good, then I still think you you're a potential candidate yeah. for this. So. And, and honestly, the thing that would make the biggest impact supplement wise would be a nutrient deficiency that you filled. So if your zinc is low mm -hmm. and then you take zinc, you'll see a big boost in testosterone. Uh, same thing yeah. with other, you know, other D. key nutrients, right? So, um, yeah. and I know, I know joy mode has those like boron zinc. I think it has in there as well, like which, magnesium. which if those are low magnesium, I think. So I would, um, you know, you could try it. And then if it fills a nutrient gap, Within forty-five to sixty days, you should feel and see a pretty a pretty big difference. If not, then like I said, you could go the other route and kind of because you're in that age group now where you know it would make sense and uh, the health benefits of taking exogenous testosterone to get you in a mid to high level versus being low is far outweigh outweighs the risks of taking testosterone and all that stuff. So you know there's a myth around that, and if your testosterone is low, there's a lot of health risks associated with that so but that's where I'd start. right I'd exactly you know so one one last idea and since we didn't give you anything jeff i want to get i want to send you maps 15 um and mm -hmm. this was something that kind of blew me away a little bit what and you might be this guy because you look like you're really fit you probably train pretty hard you also are a construction worker so you're doing a, maybe even scaling back a little bit on the amount of volume you're training and just you, see what happens yeah and just see what happens you might see a, a like and it, so i'm going to send it to you for free uh, and for fun, maybe run it for a month while you're doing like while you're while you're doing some of these things and see how that makes you feel. Uh, I was blown away by how much kind of reducing my volume of training was uh, make it made a big difference. So that yeah. Con now, considering now, you have kids, you're you're you know construction worker, and on top of that, you lift pretty intensely. That may make a difference yeah. too. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what, Jeff, just to give you some hope. Um, I've had several clients in this situation in the past. There's one guy in particular I remember. He seemed to be doing everything right. And we scaled his volume way down. We had him supplement with nutrients that if he had a deficiency, you know, could cause a problem. His testosterone went from the 200s to the 700s. Okay. So that was a dramatic difference. Now, the reason why it went so high is because he had some nutrient deficiencies and he just, he was overtrained. He just didn't realize it. And once we made those changes, it was a huge swing in his testosterone. So I've seen numbers dramatically change when there's a like a, a real reason to be to it being low in the first place. So just to give you some hope because uh, sometimes that can happen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely like follow the program to a T and so it's, you know, it could be a lot of volume on top of what I'm already doing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'll, I'll try out that uh, 15, see how that runs. You got it. How old are your kids by the way? <laughs> Seven and nine. Okay, that's a good age. I was going to yeah. say, if you had teenagers, maybe that's why your testosterone. <laughs> I got two teenagers at home. It's driving me crazy. Pull your hair out. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I just want to be, I want to just kick ass, take names, you know, at everything that I do. So, you well, know, I'm, gonna, I'm yeah, trying yeah. to optimize. That's all. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for calling in, Jeff. Yeah, I appreciate you guys. Thank you. You Thank got you, it, Adam. Yeah, great suggestion, Adam. Yeah, 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 yeah you know, I just, I, was sure. I mean, as experienced as I am and knowledgeable, quote unquote, I am as well, I constantly, slowly overtrain like little by little i bring myself to well you know i mean I, i'm looking at too like he's got you could see he's got the forearms and shoulder like he's above yeah, he's you. got some base yeah uh, yeah so he's definitely a, a serious lifter and probably been doing kissing on like and then i started thinking oh you know what kids low test a little bit he's doing all, you know what maybe the dudes just do maybe the combination of a, a slight nutrition uh, nutrient de deficiency mm -hmm. combined with a lot of volume of Tipping training over and, to the overtraining bucket. yeah with all <laughs> totally of, and just so that potentially now that being said you know, I know that we are, we are, we're, we're trying to be as politically correct and we don't ever want to come off like we're, you know, pushing people to go take, you know, testosterone. We should, we, we will always oh, stand, be balanced. Yeah. We'll always stand by that going the natural route first. But I will say this, 
he's a classic example of if he was my friend and we were off air, like, and I knew that he was, I would have just said, bro, go, go, go probably look into the HRT route mm -hmm. and talk to the doctor. Well, it's, it's one of those things that, um, especially as you get older as a man, it's the, the, the health benefits far outweigh the risk and it's a low risk hormone when used properly. That's, People don't realize And that. that's what I mean right. by, I mean, I, there's still a little bit of a stigma around it that totally. I know that if, if we on this in this podcast with all the people that are listening, if we were to say something, like, oh, go get your HRT, Dude, oh, freak out, right? But it's like it's safer than thyroid, and if you have low thyroid, they'll put you on thyroid, no problem. It's safer than estrogen or progesterone. Women take birth control all the time. It's a low risk hormone when used appropriately in the right context. I want to say that too because obviously you can use it the wrong way in the wrong context. It's just it's got this strange stigma, but the studies will show. And man, when they're low. Risk of cancer goes up. The risk of uh, heart disease goes up. Dementia goes up. And then when you bring it up to healthy levels, all those things drop. So it's like, you know, if you try all the stuff and it doesn't work naturally, it's almost a no brainer. Well, and, and he's yeah. at the the right age in his life too. I right. feel like I like we, we just had a call the other day by like a 27 year old. And we were that person. I'd be way more staunch. Totally. About, hey, you're you're too young to be feeling all this stuff, bro. Yeah, like, something's mm -hmm. going on. Yeah, something else is going on. Let's get right. to the bottom of that first before you you decide to jump to that. This guy is like, I've I've done this. I've been listening to the show forever. I'm taking Ashkelon every day. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And it's like, okay, well, you might be a great candidate for this, and it could be life changing for you yeah. to get on that. Yep. Our next caller is Ali from Georgia. Hey, Ali, how can we help you? Hey guys, um, as everyone always says, long time fan, big listener. Um, so that's why my question comes with some hesitation and nerves because I do know better as a fan and someone with a fitness background. Um, but essentially I want to paint a picture for you. I am 17 weeks into an 18 week bodybuilding prep. Um, I am, it's my very first show. So I've been self-coached my whole life and then uh, got a coach last year. And I've been prepping with her and built up in the off season to um, over 2,500 calories, got into a really good position with cardio and all that. Um, but I'm 10 days out and I found myself in you know, two hours of cardio a day, barely scratching over a thousand calories, um, really low fat. So I know from like my hormonal um, profile that's impacting me as a woman. And truthfully, I'm realized I'm in too deep and I'm in a position where I want to come out post show and absolutely do this again. Um, I, I love bodybuilding, love how much fun I've had. Um, but I want to be able to two things, get out of this cardio hole I'm in and out of while getting out of this deficit, but at the same time, optimizing how much muscle I can gain in the off season. So coming out of this and um, I hear a lot of horror stories about people getting out of prep and just really not going well, especially when you get in a bad position. So even though I've known better, I have found myself um, in a really poor position. So I was, I was curious, how can I coach myself out of this? How can I safely and effectively get out of this deficit as quickly as possible, minimizing um, fat gain and optimizing muscle gain. Yeah, well, this is this is like the perfect client for you, Adam. This, well, this is exactly what we work with. Uh, right? Yeah, this, so the, here, I, obviously we're going to finish because you're what, only, would you say 10 days out or whatever from the, the show? The biggest, yeah, the, yeah. the biggest thing that you, you need to worry about or that you need to uh, be focused on is that that first week as you come out, because the temptation to want to just, because you work so hard to get where you're at. So I totally get like the afterwards, like, ah, finally I go have my, my cheat meal or my cheat day. And then you go kind of, and it real quickly, uh, that sneaks up. And so you're going to have to, unfortunately, almost pretend like you're still in prep mode for the next four plus weeks afterwards. I mean, if you really want to come out of this successfully because of how big of a hole we've kind of dug ourselves in as far as the calorie deficit, how low the calories are, how much training you're doing. And you're, you're, I, you basically want to reverse out the way you went in. Now, I don't think it's going to take a full 
16 to 18 weeks to to get out of there. Hopefully, because you're young, you're healthy, you're strong, you've been training. Uh, uh, you you actually sound pretty good for somebody who's who's you know torturing herself that bad right now. Like <laughs> some people like look and sound like they are walking death in this position. But yeah, so I I would I would creep out. So um, if you were do if you're doing if you're at peak right now, two hours of cardio and you're as low as a thousand calories a day, then you know, the, the day after my show, I, you know, I'm going to slowly pull back. I'm going to go from two hours to maybe an hour cardio. Uh, and I, it's mostly, it looks like incline walking. So it's not like you're doing like hardcore intense, uh, cardio. Am I, am I reading that correctly? Just to pull the inflammation out of the legs, I'm doing all incline walking, keeping it easy to recover from. Okay. Yeah. So I would just, I would, I would cut that back and then I would just barely increase calories, which like I said, is going to be difficult. I mean, I might allow you right after the show to, 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 to fill back in, to have a nice, like, you know, afternoon to evening of eat. So you don't feel like you're continuing, but then the very next day, you know, I'd say we'd be, if you're a thousand forty calories you're at right now, I'm not letting you go much over 1200 to 1300 at first and also reduce the hour cardio. And then I'd probably keep you in a place like that for a week to two weeks until you give me feedback. And then I'd want to also, again, increase a little bit more calories, cut back a little bit again on the cardio, maybe cut down to a half hour of it. And then just, and I would just be inching you up by about a hundred calories to 200 calories while also kind of scaling back the amount of cardio you're doing. Uh, and then if you're doing, how many days a week are you lifting? I'm sorry, I'm reading ready your question at the same time. I, so I'm lifting six days a week on a body part split. Okay. So I would, I would potentially re reduce that down to like a MAPS anabolic type of a program also, but these would be like phases. So it'd be like one to two weeks. We would, we would make this change where we add a little bit of calories, reduce some of the cardio, get, pay attention, make sure we're not like blowing up, which you shouldn't. Your body's probably going to thank you for, for, for peeling back a little bit. And so Hopefully it starts to respond that way. And so long as you're not putting on weight rapidly, obviously you're going to put on some water weight right after the show and so that that's totally normal. But I mean, consistently putting on body fat, I would just be trying to inch you up about 200 calories. Is there a number of, of pounds that you'd be mounted? Like, like, is it okay to gain like two pounds a week or three pounds a week? Yeah. I mean, okay. so obviously you're probably going to see an initial eight to 10 right after the show because of water and everything like that, water and carbohydrates coming back in. So that, that uh, first initial... I'm not that worried about it's the consistently after that. And okay. I'd be okay with adding two pounds uh, a, a week. That's, that's plenty fine. But the goal really would be to kind of hover around the same weight. I actually would be trying to keep you, if I saw two pounds, then I might go, okay, let's kind of keep your calories and cardio where it's at now. Let's see what it does next week and see if it kind of slows down and levels off. Okay. Now let's go up again. So you're, you're really, you're, you're pretty much just doing the opposite of what you did going into it. I just think that you could probably get back up to a healthier calorie intake before 18 weeks. I don't think you're going to need to do it as slow so long as we didn't do too much damage. Right. So if the body didn't, you know, but and again, I, from what I hear from you right now, you sound OK, but this is a uh, there isn't like a protocol. It's like this was client by client. I've, I've done this with so many different ladies that some of my clients like within like three weeks, we're back up to 2,400 calories and you're doing little to no cardio and you've actually, you know, put on very little body fat and you feel amazing. Like, so if you, if your metabolism is still in a pretty good position, you could potentially rebound like that and be totally fine. But it, it would really be the communication with uh, you and I back and forth. Are you in our, our private forum by chance? No, I'm not. Fine. Okay. So I'm going to have Doug put you in the private forum. Uh, also, uh, MAPS anabolic is the way I would go training protocol wise. Um, and then it would do, it would do you well to go to performance and then aesthetic again. So I think if you haven't ran that program for, which is a very bodybuilding focused, uh, that would be the order of our, what our training protocol would look like to kind of be your off season to get ready for prep again. Yeah. I, I literally have zero to add to that. Adam's one of the best uh, in the business when it comes to reverse dieting. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I will ask this question, Ali, because you mentioned this maybe two or three times with your question, which was, I know better. I know better. I know better. So my only question for you is why, <clears throat> why are you doing or why are you going against what you know to be the right thing to do? What, what, what's driving that? For me, it was the comparison to that. So I'm in a couple private forums with other girls to have harder protocols. 
And when I got into the, well, mine's not that bad mm. and very laser focused on, you know, I'm a very task oriented person. That's probably why I was drawn to this. So turning off the boxes um, really gave me a lot of fulfillment. And it was that comparison. Like, even though I know better and I was talking to one of my girlfriends this morning, I'm like, they're going to razz me up because I know better. <laughs> um and, and and that's why I was nervous to speak with you guys, but I did, I compared myself, um, to like bikini athletes and I, I compete in figure. So, um, you know, I am a little bit bigger, so my deficit is probably just as significant. Yeah. You know, I, first, I'm not going to razz you because, um, I know better. I do a lot of shit that I know I shouldn't do. And I know better too. This is a, a, a challenge for everybody. It makes you human. And then those of us who really have a passion for fitness actually struggle with this more than anybody else uh, in our space because we love it so much, uh, probably border fanaticism, sometimes driven by insecurities, uh, oftentimes I should say. And so we often do a lot of things to ourselves that are detrimental, that really aren't helping us. And in fact, this is what helps me, okay? Because I know at the end of the day, I, I, I understand being healthy. I do value it. I have children that made a big difference having kids for me, but I also, it would be lying to myself if I didn't say that there's a piece of me that won't die, that just falls in love with lifting heavy and looking ripped. Okay. So the way that I sometimes convince myself is reminding myself that I'll look better if I do what's right for me. And that's true. So the truth is doing what's right for you, you'll actually get a better physique than doing, than going against what you know to be better. So the advice we give is not, Hey, do what we say. It's better for you. You're not going to look as good. The reality is if you do this and you do it right, you'll look better. So when you're in those positions where you're like, oh man, this ego or whatever it is, whatever you want to call it is still gnawing at me and I know better, remind yourself, I'll actually look better if I do this the right way. Yeah, I want to I want to piggyback off of that too. So when you get in this forum, please, I get in there and, and introduce yourself and say hi. There's, there's quite a few competitors that are in this forum and there's actually a couple girls that I've actually coached for a show in there who were in very similar situations. I got them in very similar situations as you are. And they'll, they'll show, share with you about stories of like Adam putting me through a prep and actually us going and competing and not even having to do cardio. So th there is a, and I can tell by your shoulders and your traps that you've got some muscle mass on you. So I know that I should have you in it. And if you say you're a figure and you're already a, a, like a thicker body type, you probably should be up north of 25, 2,400 calories with doing no cardio and maintaining a very lean physique. And in a, in a perfect world, I could get you up on stage and we never have to go below say 1500 calories. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that would, to me, that would be our goal. Like if we were coach working together and you said, Hey, I want to keep doing this, Adam, but let's do it. the goal would be, and you wouldn't have to do that long of a prep. So I took a lot of girls that used to do these 18, you know, 16, 18 week long preps and prepped them in eight weeks. Because if I do a good job in the off season of not allowing your body fat to get out of control and we only need to shred down four to 6% uh, to get you stage ready, that's a, that's six to eight weeks. I mean, I can do that in six, especially if we've done a good job of phasing cardio out, building the metabolism up to where you're burning, a, you're burning a lot of calories, you're eating a lot of calories. And looking better. Yeah. No, yeah. You'll look better. You'll feel better. And, and not have to go so aggressive with the, the, the caloric deficit. You know, what's, you know what's saving you right now, Ali? I can tell. What's saving you is you actually, besides your work ethic and consistency and all that stuff, you, you have really good muscle building genetics. I, I would argue that you probably either were an athlete or you always kind of knew that you were strong, stronger than your peers. Am I, am I hitting the nail on the head? Yes, oddly, I've always been super strong and I'm, I'm the girl who picks up weights and puts on muscle. Yeah. Like I know she doesn't exist, but and you know, that is my, um, my genetics. That is literally saving your ass right now. Like if you didn't have those genetics, you know how bad you'd be feeling right now and how much muscle you would have lost. So it's like, you're doing as well as you are in spite of all the, the bad, you know, wrong stuff that you're doing. So the good news is there's so much potential there that you're not even realizing. So once you get in tune with your body and do it the right way, like Adam's explaining, it's going to, you're going to blow yourself away by how, how amazingly your body responds and your metabolism is probably going to be more flexible and have a, a better rebound because of your muscle building genetics. So you're, you're probably in a good position, even though you're, you've dug yourself a little bit of a hole. Very encouraging because I, I've, I've realized objectively, like I take myself out of my day to day where I'm at. And so I was like, well, I'm not even going to compete again until 2024. Like there's so much I need to get, um, corrected and get back into a really good place. So 
I've been so afraid of post-show, but I will share like a very optimistic. Uh, I feel like I'm not stuck. I'm not going to be bound to a crazy rebound. So this is, this is super encouraging and, and you know, really great to hear. No, you're going to, you're going to be okay. I'll get in the forum. Doug's going to send you over the, the programs that I listed off. I'll make sure that, and I, I would love to see you follow in that in that order maps of, anabolic of, will give you for free yeah so anabolic then performance and then aesthetic while we're also reversing out in the forum give me make sure you give me feedback let me know how you're doing and so i can help you and then hopefully you can hear you'll hear some other the testimonials of that of, of of women that have actually trained either with me or done shows on their own so uh definitely reach oh. out and stay in touch with us awesome well thank you guys i appreciate you so much everything you do is awesome and no, I'm in good hands. So thanks for taking my question. It means so much. You got it. Thank thanks you. for calling in. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> I, I tell you, did I, did, what do you think, Adam? She's probably one of those, sounds like, one of those women. They have such good muscle building genetics. They could do the worst shit. Oh, I can tell she, she's, like she's, she's built just like Monique, my ex. I can, yeah. I can tell that she's built. I'd be curious to see how, I don't know what her height is, but- you know, my ex walked around at 165. Lean. Yeah, like lean year round. And then first she got, she'd hit the stage at high 140s to 150s as a figure competitor. And she had the, the shoulders and traps just like her. She's built like her. And I will say that was uh, one of her biggest challenges. She put on muscle really easy. But then when it came down to cutting, she had a really hard time. And her coach used to push her like this, used to put her super, super low. Oh. And, you know, they just never did it. She never did a really good job of of building her metabolism off in the off season. This was long before I was coaching or I ever competed, so I kind of stayed away from it. And you know, I never really trained my my girlfriends. That was always a, a th so I let somebody else. But I remember always constantly questioning, like, why has he got you doing this? Why are you doing that? Like, are you sure? Are you sure? Like, so um, yeah, no. I mean, that's she's got that benefit of that. But I also bet you that she's she's overdoing it too. Just oh, yeah. it, it, the training, like two Center, hours of cardio, six days a week, yeah, a thousand calories. And the fact that she builds muscle so easily. I mean, just uh, just her doing maps anabolic protocol. She's going to build muscle like crazy, and that would be the goal: is just follow an anabolic protocol and slowly increase calories. Let's see if we can get these calories up to three thousand plus, which is where my ex, after she went through this whole process and then started to work on the, she got up to that place to where yeah. her and I were like eating the same amount of calories every day and she was still able to stay lean. So I, I definitely think that she can get there. When your girlfriend builds more muscle than you do, that's <laughs> tough. <laughs> yes, it is. It's a hard one. This one's really important and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets, at the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injury. That's another thing. You'll see less injury as well.